Welcome back to the BJJ Fanatics Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Ford. My guest today is a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. As a blue belt, he was a Pan Ams champion, an American national champion, and a Nogi Worlds medalist. Throughout his career, he's competed internationally in Brazil and also in Europe, where he medaled at the European Championships. He's one of the, he was also one of the head coaches at his instructor, Rafael Lovato's Junior School, for over 13 years. Uh, today, he has his own Jiu-Jitsu school in Tulsa, Oklahoma, called Method Jiu-Jitsu. And before pursuing Jiu-Jitsu full-time, he was a touring musician with his heavy metal band destroyer destroyer ladies and gentlemen it's my pleasure to be joined today by dallas niles how are you today dallas good how's it going yeah, i'm doing good man i appreciate you being here i shout out to our mutual friend nick for putting us in contact uh yeah. you me and nick seem like we send a lot of music to each other back and forth now that now that we've all connected i want to tell you man power trip the, the band power trip that you sent me uh i love that band now swing of the axe is probably my favorite song by ah, but yeah uh, yeah excellent fusion of like thrash and hardcore punks that's right up my alley man i appreciate the yeah. recommendation i haven't i haven't i haven't met a single person that likes thrash music that has not loved that band yeah. they're they're one of the goats yeah. so yeah it, it, the, the, the the lead singer he passed away not long ago too right so they've got they're like they're pretty much they've wrapped it up now right they've hung it up now as far as i know yeah they they are what's interesting is like the drummer of that band has been in a ton of like underground bands. He was in this band called Hatred Surge, which is like very underground power violence stuff for those people. Like there's not many of those people, but uh, <laughs> all the bands he touched are like insane. And I didn't even know he was a drummer. He he's, does vocals, guitar, he's played bass and stuff, I believe. I didn't even know he was a drummer until he started doing Power Trip and like, holy crap, I mean, they're insane. They're so good. But yeah, unfortunately, rest in peace. Uh, yeah but That's man a, it's love that band i love sending music to people too and like showing them new bands and because that was my that was my first passion was music and so and it's still a very much a big passion to me so i'm always trying to share especially if someone likes heavy music because i remember i used to listen to some real garbage heavy music and so <laughs> getting turned on to some of this stuff i have a i like to show people some really cool stuff outside the box i guess you'd say yeah, no. Well, I greatly appreciate you sent me. A, you sent me a couple awesome Spotify playlists. Um, so for anyone out there that wants to get in contact with some good music, man, message Dallas for sure. <laughs> uh, it's funny too, like man, like lately, I don't, I don't know, like like when, when I was in high school, metal was still kind of at the forefront of most of a lot of popular music. Nowadays, it's not so much. It's it's it kind of went back underground again. So I I, I, th I guess in my head, I was thinking, man, I guess I guess this genre is not as um, wide as it used to be. But then you go on YouTube and you go during, down these Spotify you know rabbit holes and you realize man there's still a lot of like current bands that are pretty good still um so mm -hmm. that, that's been that's been refreshing for me to see because i was you know for a long time i was just listening to bands that i knew from the 80s and 90s and 2000s kind of when it was at its peak uh, mm -hmm. but it's still nice to know that there's still great bands out there and uh, you know, you've turned me on to a few so i appreciate that yeah i mean i grew up in an era like you know middle school high school where i no offense if you like these bands but you know <laughs> It was like corn and Limp Biscuit yeah. were like the big bands and like, the new metal. And, and I thought it was really good, but you know, yeah, it was new metal. And it's like what a lot of people I think don't realize sometimes when you're not exposed to that more underground stuff is like the stuff that you're hearing is like the bubble gum pop of metal. And it's like yeah. this stuff is like, there's so much beyond that and, and it's easy to miss it. If it, you know, it's not as accessible unless you're in these underground music scenes or whatever but man i remember thinking i thought i knew what good heavy music was and then just by having an open mind man i mean thank god i i was able to kind of expand upon that and same for all genres you know and uh of music i love everything i'm not just a heavy metal guy that's just i always played heavy metal but i like everything um and the more you like and get outside the box the more enjoyable music as a whole is there's more to like i used to be like no if it's not this it sucks <laughs> yeah. you know now, yeah, yeah, yeah. now i realize how silly that was and like you know so but yeah there's there's so much good good heavy music there's so many sub genres of music that i think most people are really unaware of i know i was and uh like there are whole worlds until them unto themselves you know and so yeah uh man so and some people that don't think they're metal fans i think too if they got turned on to the right kind of genre of metal, they would be surprised, you know? And so 
whatever. I could talk all day about music. <laughs> I'm <laughs> not going to do that man. to you guys. No, to no. you jiu guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, so. it's all good, man. No, it, it, it's it's funny because, yeah, like you said, like to find stuff before, you, you had to be in the right circles to get the right CDs passed around to you. Mm -hmm. Now I feel like YouTube and, and Spotify have obviously really helped open up that whole that whole portal you're talking about where you can go into all these yeah. different genres. And uh, you and I were talking about, like, uh, I've been listening a lot to, uh, before training especially, uh, melodic death metal, like mellow, mellow death metal. And so I found, like, that band Bellacore I sent you and Harakiri mm -hmm. from the Sky. And it, it's cool, yeah, you could go off onto all these, like, tangents of different, you know, different genres and, and stuff. It's always fun ex exploring new stuff like that. So, um, well, man, not, not again, not, not to deflect too, away from too far away from jiu-jitsu. Tell us about where you're from originally and what life was like before you found jiu-jitsu. Mm. Man, like a quick rundown, I guess, would be uh, I'm from Oklahoma City. You know, I was born in Chicago, but I moved to Oklahoma as a young kid. Uh, pretty much only remember Oklahoma, you know, and uh, which I'm from Oklahoma City, not like, you know, the cow pastures. <laughs> like if, if you're not from Oklahoma, most people's vision of Oklahoma is usually a little crazier than what it is, um, you know. And so, man, I grew up. I kind of gave my age away talking about those bands. Uh, you know, I was a kid in, in the, in the late eighties, early nineties. And so it was all like ninja, this ninja, that ninja turtles. I mean, you know, um, and that's where I got like an early love for martial arts was like, you know, karate kid, three ninjas, you know, um, all that stuff. And so I'd always want to do martial arts and, and my dad wouldn't let me, uh, I used to get in a fight in fights with my brother on, on the daily. And, I don't think he wanted to fuel that, that fire anymore, <laughs> you know? And so he wouldn't let me do martial arts. I grew up doing team sports and, uh, and like I said, you know, my, my two big passions growing up were skateboarding and music, just playing guitar. Uh, my dad was a professional musician and super cool too. Like, you know, uh, my dad, the thing that's so crazy about him is he, he only has one hand. He has a hook for a hand. Really? And so his hook, like opens up like this. He puts his guitar pick in his hook and like plays guitar. No way. And he he was in, he was a professional musician. He that's where I was born, Chicago. His bands like a lot of his his bands were in Chicago. He's he's kind of lived everywhere, California, Denver, all those places. And so, anyways, like growing up with like a, a, a like I remember being a kid and going to watch my dad at like the few concerts I could attend. You know that weren't in a bar or whatever. And just music was a thing in, in my life, in the house, always playing music, uh, admiring my dad, wanting to play guitar and doing that. And so, yeah, that was my passion. I really threw myself into playing guitar uh, and skateboarding. And uh, I never lost that love of martial arts, but I just didn't do it. It kind of like, you know, it just wasn't a thing. And so I got a little older and in high school and you know the ufc was starting to become a thing i remember watching like the first ufc's you had to go to blockbuster to get the videos and they were like uh in the section with like jerry springer and like the <laughs> right. the crap you weren't allowed to like you know you needed the, a parent to help you get yeah and i remember watching it and watching hoist gracie and and being like wow that's pretty crazy that this like very averagely built guy is like beating these guys and but even then, a lot of people, like, that's their first exposure and jumping off point. Even then, I, I remember it, and I thought it was cool, but then, you know, whatever, life went on, right? And so, um, man, once I got into high school, especially, same thing, music was my life. Um, but it was after high school that I graduated, and I kind of, like, was in this lull. Like, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I, I was just kind of, whatever, I almost joined the Army, like my uncle was a, is a military vet, flew helicopters in Vietnam. And, uh, you know, he took me to the recruiters and all this stuff. And, uh, I ended up not joining the army. And shortly after that, I joined my band, which you talked about destroyer destroyer, which was a big turning point for me. Cause I'd always played music, but you know, I, no bands I ever was in, did anything crazy. And that band, it, we, it was like a grindcore tech metal band, very underground, same thing. Like, you know, the popular bands in that genre aren't making like tons of money or anything, but you know, I was very into like that underground metal music at the time. And I met the guys and started playing with them. And 
before I know it, like we're touring, uh, like getting momentum back then, MySpace was a thing. Half the people watching this probably won't even remember MySpace. <laughs> but especially it was like, you know, now there's like those SoundCloud rappers or whatever. And like MySpace was kind of like a big music space too yeah. back then. And so I remember our band, we got tons of plays on MySpace and just kind of got popular pretty quick in that little world that ended up to us touring, going from, you know, we would go on tour and we'd, I'd have to bring my own little money if I wanted to eat, you know? And so we'd just spend the, the money we'd make for the shows on gas cause it wasn't a lot. And then before you know it, we're making money and I'm being able to like sustain myself on tour, getting signed to a record label, um, you know, being in some really cool magazines. Like, I don't know if you're familiar with like decibel magazine. Yeah. They're one of the better, yeah, Decibel is like one of the better metal magazines um, out there. And we are like in Decibel getting reviews, like a 10 out of 10 review, which was crazy, like top 40 albums of the year, which was funny because the band is very polarizing. Like we, for as many 10 out of 10 reviews as we got, we got a lot of one out of 10 reviews too. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. You're like, this is unlistenable. <laughs> and so, um, you know, and so the, the, the band picked up and, I remember, oddly enough, like being on tour, going to like Barnes and Noble and still like flicking through martial arts magazines and stuff like I, 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 I the, it never went away. And, and then I got it. I started getting into the UFC and moreover back then I got into pride. Yes. Um, I remember like Fox sports net would play pride fights, uh, you know, for free. You didn't have to like get a pay-per-view. You just watch reruns of the old fights and, I remember seeing these guys on there, like Shogun, Fedor, Vanderlei, like these guys. I was like, holy shit, man, <laughs> like, these guys are animals. And, uh, and they were. <laughs> and uh, I was really just into it. And I, and I always had this romanticized version of martial arts, right? And, like, and I was like, man, I would love to do that one day. And like in my head, it's like the Rocky montage of like just, you know, being in the mountains and training. And then I'm, I'm fighting after after one season of training and, <laughs> um, you know, I just, just the passion never died or like that little thing of just the interest in martial arts never went away. And with it becoming more mainstream and seeing those athletes and, and, and being wowed by what they're doing. Um, I was just so impressed. And, and then, you know, oddly enough, uh, not oddly, but what happened was I ended up exiting the band and all of a sudden I went from pursuing my dreams in music and, and kind of doing that one thing to having nothing in my life, like nothing at all. And, and, and a lot of my friends at the time that were involved in that, that kind of music scene or whatever, they were going to bars most nights and, and drinking. And that was not the path I wanted to take. And I knew I needed to do something productive or, or positive. And all of a sudden, you know, I had my own money. I was working at Starbucks at the time. Like they would let me go on tour and come back. And I'm like, I'm 22 years old at the time. And so, uh, I was like, you know what, man, nothing's holding me back. I'm going to try this martial arts stuff out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a try. I'm going to do my, do the Rocky thing and then fight for pride. <laughs> and, uh, and I joined and I joined Lovato's, uh, school of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And actually, you know, most people tuning in will probably know my instructor, Rafael Lovato jr. But actually it was his dad. That was my first coach. Uh, Lovato senior used to, he taught the morning classes and most of the fundamental classes where junior would teach the advanced guys and more evening times. Um, and so senior was my first coach and that's, that's what started my foray into martial arts. All of a sudden I was just like, you know, what, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I, and I signed up long story short and I, I just, I never looked back and here I am today. Uh, 17 years later, I think is the number of training yeah talk about such a a a, a uh, stroke of luck of being in the same town as rafael lovato because i mean my instructor is damian maya right rolling with damian he's maya. okay yeah he's pretty good <laughs> <laughs> it's so so rolling with damian there's only a few people i've rolled with ever in my life where who, where i just felt completely like nothing i've ever learned is working here you know what i mean one of them was with rafael the others with my current instructor damian maya mm -hmm. they, they both do this thing where like man like any of your any of the superior options that are available are just not available they, they limit your options and then they make you do these things that yeah. you know are rudimentary mistakes so i can only imagine just man how that must have been coming up under mm -hmm. him under, for all those years that just must have been really incredible 
You know, what's funny, and it's one of those things too, like you said, it was a stroke of luck in a sense. Um, you know, everyone, once you're involved in jujitsu long enough, you start to know the names, you know, who's who, but in the beginning, you know, you don't know what you don't know. You don't, you don't, and even, even hearing someone's a world champion, like almost isn't even that impressive to a lot of people. Um, because you know, everyone touts themselves as being world-class, you know, they're like, Oh yeah, I won the Naga worlds. It's like, okay. Like, you know what I mean? So like people throw this, like every, every school on their website says they're world-class and, and, and says, Oh yeah, we're the premier school in your city. Uh, even though they're not. <laughs> um, and so sometimes it's even hard to navigate. You're like, I don't even know if the real good guy is the real good guy, if that makes sense, you know? And so, so I was doing a lot of research and back then, you know, when I was looking now, there's a lot of, there's a lot more choices now than ever. And so it could probably be very difficult to navigate who's super legit versus like who's okay or whatever the case might be. Um, and so I, anyways, back then there was less choices. It was like Raphael, uh, and then there's a school red line in, in Edmond, uh, which is like a near suburb. And those were like the two bigger schools at the time from what I could tell are like the ones that had websites that looked, you know, presentable. And I was like, okay. Um, and through like researching Raphael, I'm a big researcher. So I like, I'm that guy who like, before I buy something, I'm like Googling it like a ton. And so, uh, I was researching and, and trying to figure out, you know, how good are these guys? Cause actually I am also one of those people. Like if I go in on something, I go all in. And so even as a newbie who had never trained before, I was considering moving to Brazil or California, or like one of those places where I knew it was like a Mecca to like find the best training. In fact, I think at the time, uh, unless I'm just totally mis misplaced, but I think Robert Drysdale was doing like a live in thing where you could live and he would host you like they had bunks and I, I was considering it. Like I was like, I'll find one of these guys that's like a killer and I'll, I'll, I'll I'm going to go all in right. Like Rocky montage. Yeah. And so, um, I start Googling Raphael and I could see that he actually was like traveling the world and competing and like was legitimately at an, a very high level. And so, you know, I'm also that person. I'm like, if there's two options where I live and you know, the, I'm going to, who's the best guy. And there's nothing against Ty and Redline Cause he, he's a good martial artist. He is actually uh, going back to metal and stuff like that. He, is friends with Maynard from Tool, oh, wow. and he actually uh, helped him get his school up and running. And I know he still goes out there, wow. um, so he's very good. But you know, he he wasn't uh, uh, like a a competitor the way Raphael was or anything like that. You know, and so I knew I wanted to go all in, and I knew like Raphael was the choice for me. And so, um, so I end up going to Lovato's, and I believe I believe the year I, I started, I started in October. I don't remember what day, but it was October of uh 07 which that's the year he won worlds you know and so it was like literally i joined like two months after he wins the world championships wow. but he's also like he grand slammed that year he had already won a lot of other stuff the brasileiro europeans pans you know so he was on a tear that year especially um and so i joined right and, and i can tell he's just like a, a cut above like on that competition circuit you know and so like I said, I'm the guy, if I have to pay double, I'll pay double to go with the guy that's here, right? That's yeah. just me and my personal, and I understand it's not a, a realistic for a lot of people. You have to stay within your budget and whatever. And like I said, I was working at Starbucks and tuition was $100 a month when I joined, which nowadays is like that's cheap, yeah. unheard of. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, even for like a, a, you know, a program that's not super, you know, even schools here that aren't, even training seven days a week are, are, are over a hundred bucks. So, and at the time that was a lot of money for me on my little Starbucks baby salary. And, uh, you know, and so, but I was, I, I knew it was, it would be worthwhile, a worthwhile endeavor. So that was a big, a big appeal. I was like, I'm going to go here, you know, and I'm going to train with Raphael, but I, d I still, I didn't know he was quite the, the badass that he was, <laughs> you know, I just knew he was the, the best guy in Oklahoma you know, from what I could suss out and, and his dad and stuff like that. And so I did, I just, I did get very lucky. Like, and, and man, me and Raphael were a year apart in age. We were supposed to go to the same high school. We were like almost neighbors. Like wow. we lived very close to each other. So it's so funny. It's like, Oh, here I am. Like this, this guy who's like on his level has been 
like blocks away from me this entire time. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, yeah, man, I, it was just, it was just, it was luck. It was lucky. And, and the, the, the realistic thing too, is like, I never fancied myself. Like I said, I wanted to fight and stuff. But I never, I, I'm joining at 22. I'm figuring it's past my prime. I had bad knees from skateboarding. Uh, I, I, I didn't even think I'd be able to last very long. I, I imagined I was like, I'm going to give it a try. Cause it's, I've always wanted to, but I bet I have to quit in six months or whatever. Uh, I bet my knees give out on me, you know, and I, and I played baseball growing up and I was a catcher, uh, most of my life, which is really tough on the knees as well. And so I, I didn't know I'd stick around. Um, and my, my plan, my goal was that I would train and I would train really hard for like a year. Once again, in my mind, I thought a year was really going to do something. <laughs> and, uh, I was telling myself like within that year, I'm going to figure out what I want to do for like a career and I'm going to go to college. And then, you know, while I'm in college, I'll still train, but like this first year I'm gonna train balls to the wall, which I did. I mean, for my first handful of years, I mean, it wasn't uncommon for me to not take a break, but like have one day off of two weeks of training and do one day off. Wow. And I would do two a days. So I'd come in the mornings and train with senior and then I'd go and train at night. Um, so, but I was also 22 and a lot more resilient, you know, I could train balls to the wall. And, and so I trained honestly for years and years more than anyone else, uh, there outside of maybe Raphael. Um, there's no one that came close to at least that first five, six, seven, eight years. Uh, I, it all runs together now. I mean, I was, that's all I did, you know, and it was train, 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 train. I got rid of any outside hobby. Um, but my idea was that I, I would still figure out what I was going to do. I didn't know, you know, going into it that I, it was going to end up like that. But I was like, my first year, I'm going to train balls to the wall. I'm going to become like the, the chosen one. <laughs> and I will, I will be an amazing MMA fighter. But also, I'll figure out what to do and go to college. I, I thought about trying to go to medical school. I thought about trying to become a psychologist. I could just never pinpoint something that I was like ready to go all in on and to spend that kind of money on like and be unsure. I was like, and nothing ever clicked, you know? And so before you know it, one year turns into, okay, I'll do this thing for another year, figure out what I want to do with my life, go to college, blah, blah, blah. And before you know it, it's like a few of those years go by. And, and like you mentioned, especially at the lower ranks, I had a lot of success, not initially. I mean, at first I couldn't win, we couldn't win anything. <laughs> and so, uh, but I knew it was a part of it, you know, and I think that's a really good thing that a lot of my students I see in them is they get too hard on themselves too quick and like not winning stuff early on, like disappoints them. And they're like, Oh man, this just isn't for me. Uh, I'm not good. And I'm like, you're not supposed to be good. Like, it's okay. Like, and that was one of my strengths. I think in the beginning was not being competitive early on that competitive nature is good to have if you're going to be a competitor, but can also, bite you in the ass early on if you're 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 expecting this and you're not getting it yet and it's like and now you quit because you think it's not for you and it's like man literally had you stuck it out one more year two more years like you, you, people don't understand the shift it takes so long to actually get good at jujitsu like it's things don't just click overnight and i i've seen guys that were not great and and, and even like slow learners that just stick it out and they become absolute machines I think it's an asset to not be overly competitive in the beginning uh, because of the how, the how long the learning curve is, you know. Um, if you're overly competitive, you're just going to get your ass beat over and over and it's going to grind on you. You're going to want to quit. Uh, you know, if you're okay with being beat for a while, man, it makes the process a lot easier. And then, like I said, I, I, for me personally, my journey was being fine with it, but also knowing I sucked to over the years, believing in my skill set, being like, you know, and I am getting good. Okay, I shouldn't be getting caught here. And that actually started to bring out a little more competitiveness in me. Like, no, I'm not going to let this guy get me. He does, he shouldn't get me. You know, um, and, and I think it's a good asset to have. Where I think there's a misconception that you need to be super competitive in the beginning, and that's what's going to help carry you. And I think that it's backwards. You know, so. Well 
you know, I'm curious. I'm curious about whether or not with your journey it was di it was different from some people's because you you mentioned two things that you were really into before jujitsu. You were into playing guitar and you were into skateboarding. Those are two things that take a lot of dedication to get good at. You know, it takes a long time to to learn to be good at guitar for a lot of people. Uh, for skateboarding, man, it takes some people years to even learn how to do an ollie. Do you feel that your time spent in other activities that that you have to suck at first in order to be good helped you have that mindset when you came into jujitsu? Never really thought about that, <laughs> um, and and possibly, because yeah, I mean, you get comfortable with sucking for a long time because those things are hard. I, you know, guitar, you can it definitely takes a while to become great, but you know, you can put in a few months and, and feel some progression. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe I just got comfortable with sucking. I think I think a big thing too is like, uh, I grew up playing baseball, like I said, uh, and I played soccer a little bit. I was was not great or anything, but. Um, I played a lot of team sports and oftentimes the winning and losing is not really up to one person. Uh, typically it's like a, a team thing. And so I think also being younger, getting used to like, Oh, the, we lost the game, but it wasn't really just my fault or your fault is all of our faults or we won the game. And it wasn't usually just one guy all the time that won the game for everybody. And so, um, I, I guess like feeling like winning and losing wasn't fully in my control. Uh, maybe that helped me versus you grew up wrestling or something and it, it, that might create a different mindset. Um, jujitsu was the first thing for me, like where like winning and losing was all me and all on me. And, and so that, I think that had something to do with it, you know, and I'll tell you what too, like seeing rough, I was just inspired, you know, I got to, I was in there. Rafael's traveling the world. He's doing competitions. And not only is he doing that, but his top guys are joining him. They're going to the Europeans with him. They're going to the worlds with him. It was really easy for me to be like, man, I want to be a part of that. And, and oddly enough, with touring with my band, we toured a lot, uh, but it was all U.S. tours. We had offers for European tours that we couldn't take people up on. Our vocalist, actually, he was in college. His parents uh, bought him a house. It's like the deal is like, you know, as long as you're going to school, we'll buy you the house. You don't have to have a job. You just go to school. That's your job. And then so we could only tour in the summers. We do like full summer tours for like three months uh, or two months or whatever it was. And then like a lot of the breaks. And so we had to turn down a lot of like really killer stuff. We got we got um, offered some really big tours that we had to turn down that were like in Europe. And, and I always wanted to go to Europe and I wanted to travel and see the world. Um, and I wasn't able to do it through my band and seeing that there was an avenue in jujitsu. And like, I was like, man, I want to be one of those guys. And I think that also helped to influence or just inspire me too. Um, Cause like I was telling you, I, I wanted to be an MMA fighter. I actually wanted to do Muay Thai. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Ong Bak yeah, or like course. the protector. Yeah, dude. I wanted to be Tony jaw, <laughs> like, you know, Tony <laughs> J, awesome. whatever, like, and, and I, I actually, like I said, I watched the UFC and I watched Pride, but I loved Shogun. I loved Vanderlei. I loved Fedor. I loved these guys that were knocking the shit out of people. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I want to be a, just like, I want to be in the Matrix and, and be a Muay Thai guy. And, and I, I was that quintessential, like classic, uneducated, like fan. I was like, oh, boo, stand them up. They're just hugging each other. <laughs> you know, like I didn't like jujitsu. I thought it was stupid and weak. I was like, this is lame, you know? And like, um, but I knew I'd seen guys that had zero jujitsu that were excellent strikers just get totally obliterated by jujitsu guys. So I, I knew I needed to have a little bit of jujitsu, like enough to defend, but I did not want to be a grappling specialist. And, and through doing jujitsu, everything just switched. I was like, man, jujitsu is so fun. It's totally different doing it than what you see from the outside looking in when you're uneducated um on, on the sport and so i i loved it seeing rafael being at a high level and just like waxing the floor with everybody without even trying and hitting crazy arm bars and and things from everywhere i was just like man this is insane and you learn to grow an appreciation for it and then i loved it i was like this is this is a lot deeper than striking like you know striking is great i, I do love striking um and not to say it's like not, you know, not to talk shit on it, but it, 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 there's only so many ways to punch, kick somebody. And it's more about combinations and a lot of X factors, my distance, my timing, the angles, uh, 
there's not so many techniques to pull from, you know, and in jujitsu, it's like, man, if you're built like this, you should do this. If you're built like that, you should look for this. And there's just so many ways to skin the cat, so to speak, you know, and, and I found it very intriguing. And so, uh, I quickly was like, man, uh, Raphael was not fighting MMA at this time. And all he was doing was jujitsu. And so I was just so inspired and, and got so into it and started to fall in love with it. And I just wanted to be one of those guys traveling and competing and, and, you know, I surprised myself with, with, oh, I thought I'd only be able to do it for six months and my knees would give out. And, you know, I was, a, I was able to make it like 12 years before I had my first knee surgery, you know? And so I surprised myself in some ways um, and was just really inspired by that. So inspired by that. And it just only helped grow my love of jujitsu. And I went from, you know, half of my training sessions were striking classes, half of them were jujitsu classes. And I was like, you know what? No, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be one of these guys. I'm gonna, I'm gonna like compete jujitsu, try to win tournaments. I'm gonna go all in, and then before you know it, you know, I'm doubling the amount of grappling I'm doing because I dump all of the striking classes. I'm like, MMA went on the back burner. I was like, all right, whenever I'm a black belt, then I'll think about MMA again. Um, but I was like, I want to be high level. Like, I, it just. It just showed me, it let me respect it in a different way, I guess, you know, just feeling it and, and then obviously feeling it with him because he is an outlier. He's not your average jujitsu coach, <laughs> you know, I'd say. Yeah. And so feeling all that on the daily, uh, it only helps steer me into that path. Let me ask you this, man. What do you think? Do you think there were any correlations between learning to play guitar and learning jujitsu? Have you noticed any similar building blocks, any similar concepts or theories that you think cross over between music and, and martial arts? The the thing that I got a lot, actually, uh, I actually talk about it all the time when I'm teaching, uh, is doing something slow and doing it correct uh, and not get ahead of myself too quickly. Like, I can remember trying to learn how to play, like especially uh, instead of chords, starting to learn scales and trying to play leads. And you got to, you know, start working your way all the way around. And the faster you go, then you just, oh my God, you, it gets out of control and you mess up, right? And so that's uh, exactly what happens with techniques. You know, you, I tell my students, I, I see them getting going too fast and doing it wrong and getting ahead of themselves. I'm like, look, I know you want to go fast, but the fastest way to go fast is to go slow in the beginning. And it's like. It's a checklist. We're hitting, we're, we're hitting that whole checklist and you're building that muscle memory, going slow. And then before you know it, you're going lightning fast and doing everything correctly. If you, if you go too fast on that in the beginning, you're going to mess up. You're going to get ahead of yourself. And so that was something that guitar playing actually did really help me with because I, I felt firsthand how much better, how much quicker I could get better by actually just going slow in the beginning, you know, and no one wants to go slow <laughs> and, and so people really struggle with that and you want they want to go fast too soon it's like man take your time you even though you're going slow you are building muscle memory you know and that pattern that you're creating is what's going to help you go fast and still make sure you're hitting all those things and doing it properly every time and so yeah man that like i do think it's a different animal but there's so much correlation and crossover you know even talk to my students about the fundamentals you know get getting your fundamentals down, you know, it's like, it's like playing music. You, you, if you understand the music theory and this theory behind what you're doing, you can play any style of music that you want. People want to start doing the fancy stuff really quick. Right. And there's nothing wrong with it. My, my personal like goal is always to meld fundamental old school pressure. I mean, you know where I'm from, like with modern jujitsu, like uh, their modern jujitsu is there and, and killing it for a reason. You know, I'm not one of these people that shits on modern jujitsu and is like, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I do think there is not a lot of, enough respect around good old school jujitsu amongst certain people, you know? And so that's one of the reasons I love like Victor Hugo, for instance, one of my teammates. He is a great representation of good, fundamental, like pure, just basic jujitsu with modern jujitsu. I mean, the guy is. Uh, you know, he inverts effortlessly for a big guy, has great leg attacks, so on and so forth. But yeah, so I, I'm always like, you know, you guys have to learn the notes before you can even learn the scales, before you now can write music. It's like, and that's the goal. We're learning the theory, which allows us to put our stamp, our artistry on it, where, um, you know, same thing I talk about words. It's like, you got to learn the alphabet 
before you can start making sentences, you know? And so it's a process where people, it's easy to be exposed to that higher end. Like you, you show up to class and you see these guys doing crazy shit and you're like, I want to do the crazy shit. And I'm like, me too, <laughs> you know, but, but you will, by really pouring into that theory, um, that's the sort of thing that where you can find yourself at a level one day where you can teach yourself. You don't need a teacher. You can get to a point where you now have the theory, the knowledge, okay, my head's open here if I do this, my arm's open here. So you can improvise on the fly in positions that you're not even familiar with or you're better suited to something happen and you can reverse engineer it, you know, instead of having to learn a position for a position for a position, you know. And so by really understanding those, those, those foundational jujitsu things, like I, I just think they go further than people sometimes realize because it's very common. It was for me to, ah, oh, this move sucks. It only works on white belts and it's still hard half the time on white belts, right? Or, you know, you can only do this to a white belt. And uh, it's just not the case. It's just most people don't put in the, the effort to figure out those little things that make the big shift. Um, you know, for me, a big, a big thing is I remember Cron Gracie when he was a brown belt. I was watching Cron do freaking hip bump sweeps on, on brown belts in the open class twice his size. I was like, how can Cron do that to a top level brown belt? And I can't do this to a white belt, you know, and that started my obsession, so to speak, with like fundamental jujitsu, you know, and how it's about how you set the guy up, how you make him fall in the trap, the energy exchange between you two. Uh, it just left such an impression, him, guys like him, Hodger, and then my coach, you know, Raphael, dude, he'll mount your, he'll mount you and hit you with X chokes all day and you'll know they're coming and you won't be able to do a damn thing about it, you know? And you, you referenced like rolling with him and his style and that's the style, it's that always moving forward pressure. Uh, you talked about every move you made, it was like worse and worse and that's it. It's, it's, I tell people it's like, it's rolling, it's rolling in quicksand. Yes. The more you move yes. and the more you try, the more you drown yourself, yes. and the faster you drown yourself, you know? And so, and I get it, you know, not a lot of people are exposed to feeling that kind of pressure on a daily basis. And so you just don't know what you don't know yet. And it's easy to kind of give up on some stuff. And so, but once you understand that, once you have that ice as a big guy, so avoid the mount like the plague, I was like, man, if I'm up here, I'm having to base to not get rolled over. Or if I'm trying to attack you, that means I can't base. So I'm not confident in attacking, you know, and learning how to navigate these positions that that people are, are avoiding like the plague. Once you have it down, man, it's like, it's like you're in heaven. Like, you know, where at first you're like, man, this, I know I'm in a good position, but it doesn't feel good. Like I'm having to work my ass off just to stay on top, you know? And it's, it's, it's so many little things that will completely shift that around for you. Uh, if you, if you work and you give it the time and the due respect. And so actually the language I use in my school, my fundamental program isn't called fundamentals or basics or beginners. It's called essential, uh, because to me it's essential jujitsu. It's, it's those other words they make it sound lesser, you know, and it's not, it's, 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 you need this stuff. And especially if you're going to get into a real confrontation, that straight up like old school jujitsu is where you're going to be able to to beat some ass like very easily. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a place for that. And so I just, you know, I know I'm an outlier, uh, typically, but like, I just, I had too many things happen that made me reevaluate and fall in love with like real fundamental basic stuff, you know? And like I said, I still, I, I absolutely have some crazy advanced positions. Uh, but, but, I also love some of that. I see black belts. I was teaching, I was teaching private lessons to black belts when I was a purple belt on the mount and the X choke because they'd come and I'd X choke them and they're black belts. And like, I still can't X choke people. And I'm like, yeah, it's really common. <laughs> like, you know, it's a, some of that stuff is, is the day one jujitsu is some of the hardest stuff to actually like become very proficient in, let alone against another high level guy. And so I get it. And, and I felt it. And, and, and it, it wows people sometimes. They're like, man, I can't even do this stuff to, to blue belts and I'm a black belt. Um, and it's usually these little things that just completely change it all. So, uh, but a big piece of that definitely is my lineage. Like, you know, Raphael, Shanji, you know, these guys, Salo, it's uh, watching Hodger. I mean, I had struggles with certain moves and I just would watch Hodger and see what he would do. And all of a sudden that one little thing completely changed everything. It took my 
percentage of being able to hit that move from like 10% to like 2000%, like, you know, turned a move I almost never went for into one of my best things, you know? And so I just, I love, I love figuring out these little details and I feel that everything has that. There's always these little, little things that change everything. That's excellent, man. Dallas, what do you think are some good goals that people like students can put into practice um, in their day-to-day -day training to help them improve their fundamentals and help them improve these essential aspects of jujitsu that you're talking about? Do you, do, do you generally encourage students to have like a goal in mind when they're showing up to train? And if so, what, what, kind, of, what kind of things can they structure to, to focus specifically on these essential things? Yeah, uh, goals, I mean, are definitely huge. It's so easy to show up and go through the motions and not have a particular goal in mind. And this is something I picked up from my professor, Raphael. Like, I mean, he would have weeks where he would show up and he would only X choke you. Like he, he could see there's arm bars opportunities. There's all these opportunities and he would only be satisfied if he hit that one thing. And so sometimes just by setting a challenge for yourself will force a lot more growth. Um, you know, learning how to be okay with being in bad positions or, or being an upper belt, it's like if you're the top dog, it's easy to go all night long and not have your guard passed or not be put in the side control, be put in, in the mount. And, and, and some people don't have the ability to swallow their ego enough to like let people be see, see them being seen in a bad position. Um, and so learning how to challenge yourself like that, it, 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 that's what forces growth. And, and same thing, man, just luck. I was with Raphael. He was he was winning worlds in these big move, these big tournaments. And yeah, everyone knows he trains with Shanji and Salo, but what I think some people fail to realize is, is he'd only trained with them like 2% of the time, you know, he'd fly out and train with him for a week and have to come back home. And so the majority of his training was done with his blue belts, his purple belts, you know, and, but Raphael will, he's the guy who will let you pass his guard. He will let you do stuff. He will hit the row machine so that he's gassed so that he, he's so tired and now you actually have a shot at him, you know, and seeing that really helped me realize like how to train, you know, and then, and then, yeah, like the, the, the essential stuff, those, those little things, just learning for me, it's more about, you know, it's easy to show the X choke. It's easy to show a scissor sweep. Um, and be like, this is the move, but you don't really, a lot of guys, they don't tend to show like the trap, the energy, like what is, you see it in judo. It makes more sense. It's like, if I want to throw you forward, you're probably going to resist me backwards. So I need to have a backwards throw. If you're going to resist that, you're coming back into what I wanted in the first place. And that's that, that same exchange happens on the ground, but it's too easy to look at just the one, the one side for a scissor sweep. I need to pull you in and load you up to do it. Everyone knows if you just sit back on your heels and hunker down, I can't sweep you, but how can I now punish you for doing that? And then typically when I punish you for that enough, you're going to want to come into me. And now you're giving me the thing I was looking for in the first place. And, and so I try to get my students outside of just the move as a move and think about the energy exchange, the forward, the backwards. If I'm, I'm attacking you because I'm getting you forward, but if I can't do that, then I can't do the move. So I have to have something to attack you going backwards, which in general will now bring that move back to me in the first place, you know? And, and so just some of these looking beyond move for move for move uh, and, and going a little deeper into that without getting too insane, you know, you have brand new white belts. You don't want to leave their, their brains on the mat, you know? So, um, but there's a line that you can tow right there. And, and like I was saying, just having an objective goes a long way. You know, if you give me two guys and they are clones of, of themselves, they're doing the same amount of training. The guy that just shows up and goes through the motions and just is always playing his a game versus I get a guy who's really paying attention. He's challenging himself. He's trying these moves. He's doing more positional sparring, not just doing full out rolls because they're more fun. That guy will leave his clone in the dust, you know? And so th this intention that you come with these things, they're, they're powerful tools that are easy to just like kind of, it's easy to just show up and do class and learn the thing kind of, and then just roll for the rest of the night, you know? But that stuff is not what pays the dividends if you're really after skill. If you're, if you're just trying to have fun and being a hobbyist, I get it, man. Like have fun with it. But if you're trying to have the finest technique and, and really challenging yourself and, and really growing as a martial artist, that's not the way to train. Actually, I would, I would tell you like rolling 20% of the time is probably the best thing to do. And then doing more positional sparring, more drilling. Like those are the things that pay the dividends, but they're not the sexy things, you know, that's not the fun stuff. And I get that. And so 
you also have to care enough about growing that you're willing to do the not fun stuff for the return. Right? And I don't blame people for not wanting to do that stuff, like I said, but I do blame them if they think they're trying to become super good and they're going to become a great competitor and they're not doing that stuff. Well, then now that's different. Now you're, you're not doing what you need to do to become a great competitor. And that's a different conversation, of course, but uh, all these things help. And that's what I try to give my students. I try to challenge them nightly. I don't just say, oh, great, here's a couple moves, let's roll. Uh, I definitely structure things for, you know, to try to make my students to get as good as they can, as fast as they can. And I, I have my systems that I believe uh, do that. Um, and, and that's what they need from me too, because it, uh, I learned that from my coach. Had he not taught me, I wouldn't be doing that, you know? And so that's where those students, they need you, you know, and they need you to guide them properly. And it's too easy to rein it in, I think, as a coach to just, yeah, here's a couple moves, let's roll. You know, I, I hear it all the time. It, that, that's how certain classes are being run here or there. And I'm just like, man, that sucks. These guys are not getting their money's worth. But to them, they don't know that because they haven't been anywhere else. And, and like I said, I, it's not lost on me that I was fortunate to just end up in a world-class place from day one, you know. That's incredible, man. You know, so, something you said there I really appreciate, too, is the importance of pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. And you, you mentioned how Raphael would, like, hit a row machine and then do specific training where you have a higher percentage, mm -hmm. a higher, you know, probability of catching him. <clears throat> uh, what are some other things that you encourage students to do? You mentioned that you have some, some specific methods that you like to follow with your students and some mm -hmm. uh, particular systems that you think help development, uh, help increase development. W what are some of those things, if you don't mind me asking? No, a lot of it's just the structure of my class. Like I don't waste time on warmups that are that I deem to be not that there's no crossover. You know, me having you jog around the mats and do jumping jacks just ate into class time and it taught you zero jujitsu where I can actually have you drilling and doing this stuff to warm up that is jujitsu correlated. So that's one thing I like to do and a lot of other people do that too. But there's a lot of people that are just like it's a calisthenics warm up before you start training. And also to me, that makes zero sense because you, you need to be warm before you roll at the end of the night, not in the beginning before you're about to learn a bunch of technique and kind of take it easy. And so that never made sense to me. And so a lot of my stuff is just highly targeted at we're building skills in our warmups. And then like I said, I teach, I like to teach like both sides of the equation. I showed the offense, um, but then it's also the combination. Like, you know, it's that energy exchange like I was talking about. I like to use that scissor sweep analogy it's like, I'm not just going to show you the sweep. I'm going to be like, hey, you're going to try this. And more often than not, the thing you're going to run into is the guy sitting down, sitting back. And now we have to deal with it like that. And that alone is going to help us have more success with the move early on and respect the move. There's so many moves that I didn't even get good at until I was a brown belt. And half of it was because I didn't respect it. I was like, I don't need to do that move. It doesn't work very good. And I can do this one instead. You know, but once I actually took the time to, to suss out some of those details, it, it, it went from... I hardly ever do this to, man, this is actually one of my highest percentage best moves. And so just the, the way they learn, and then I challenge them to do positional sparring. We always do positional sparring before we do full rounds. Because like I said, it's easy. I can show you a move, and you might have an hour of sparring and never even be in that position to be able to use what we just showed. So how are you going to develop that? You're just going to forget about it, you know, or have to see it over and over over the course of years for it to actually set in. Um, and so I want my guys spending a lot of time on it and putting, narrowing down the world that they can operate in and staying in there. And then we'll open it up later. But like now you've actually put in some time and you understand that. And even if you're not going to be a specialist in this game, you've also put in time defending that against your partner. So which, you know, when it comes to offense, you can be a lot more picky and choosy. When it comes to defense, you have to be ready for an assortment of things, whether it's your A game or not. And you have to be capable of shutting it down. And so that's really important on both sides of that coin. Um, and then, yeah, just sparring, telling people, man, try it. Like for me, I, I'm a half guard player. I'm an, uh, I'm an X guard butterfly. I sit, I'm a seated guard guy. When, for years and years and years and ages, like over a decade, if I was laying flat on my back, I was basically a blue belt. If I was sitting up, when I, even when I was a blue belt, if I was sitting up, I was almost a black belt if I could put you in my half guard. My half guard was a black belt. The rest of me wasn't. But, um, you know, it, like, and so what I start, it, there's definitely like shifts. I'm just trying to, a lot of these shifts happen, I feel like, to a lot of people once you get your black belt, um, where 
you know, I didn't care that I sucked on my back because I wasn't on my back. I was in my half guard. But then all of a sudden getting that black belt, I was like, man, the fact that if I lay on my back and one of my blue belts can pass my guard like that, that bu bugs the shit out of me. <laughs> and it didn't before because I was like, I don't need to do that, you know? And so I think a lot of people feel that. They get their black belt and these things that they're just like, I don't need that arm bar because I do this arm bar. You know, now it bothers them that they can't do that one arm bar, especially that's where you always hear this trope of like, uh, oh, I got my black belt and that's when I went back to the basics, right? Because now it bugs the shit out of them that they can't scissor sweep the white belt, you know? And so um, where it's like, I, I want to, to save my students that pain, I guess. And I, so I'm always trying to hammer that, like what I, my experience to them and, and do things in a way where they, like I said, they're having really high success rate, you know, uh, at some of this fundamental stuff early on. And so they get, they get that love for it and they won't have to get their black belt and then be like, oh man, I suck at this, you know? And so that's, but that's just a me thing. It's just me putting my experience out there. It's a mix of my love of, of good fundamental jujitsu with just my experience of Hey man, I used to not even sit for an arm bar until I was like a, a black belt from Mount because I didn't want to risk them coming up and stacking me and me losing position. But really it's two things that I picked up and I'm like, that will never happen almost, like almost never will that happen. Um, you know, but it, it took me really figuring that stuff out and I just, I see it. I can see that my students that get Mount and they're scared to go for the arm bar. They're scared to go for the X choke. And once you learn that stuff, it frees you of all that fear. You know, and, and then and at the same time too, defense. Defense is like the most unsexy thing to work in all of jujitsu. Who wants to get mounted and just have to fight out of that? But I also like my students understanding that that high level defense also gives you the ability to throw a lot of offense at your guy. I love Gary Tonin for this. Gary, it will go just basically he will go ape shit. He'll throw everything in the kitchen sink at you because he knows even when he misses even if you have a good shot at him, he's going to be able to be back in good position before you know it. His defense is still going to lead to offense. And most people only want to ever work their offense um, because that's the fun, sexy stuff. And, and they don't realize actually having that sick defense will absolutely like, like unburden your offense and let you have that power just go absolutely ham on people. You know? And so I tell myself, I'm like, if you want to be dangerous, you need to work your defense or your offense, but you need that defense because that's where your confidence of even when you slip up, you can just throw it at people because you know you're going to get back in a good position. They're not going to get you. It's going to be okay. Where I think a lot of people are real trigger shy because they know the second they slip up and they're in a bad spot, it's over. You know, and that's the last thing you want. So, yeah, I, I guess I'm like I have a big love of defense as well. And you don't want to be too defensive. You know, you want every you want to be blended. But that's the this goes back. How commonly is it to see? that one guy in the gym who only rolls with like white belts who he can beat the shit out of. And because half of that's his ego, he can't take tapping. And that guy will develop offense, but he's not putting himself in bad spots. So his defense will suffer. And then at the other side, you even get guys, they only roll with the, the better guys there because it's also an ego thing. Like, yeah, they're losing every match, but they get to say, Oh no, I train with the, the big dogs, you know? No, I only train with the bad boys. And, and the, the fact is that guy's defense is getting pretty good, but his offense sucks, you know? And so you gotta, you gotta push yourself outside of these things if you really actually wanna get good. You know, you have to have a well-rounded, you gotta go with guys that beat the shit out of you. you. Gotta go with guys that you can beat up and you can work your offense. You, and then the worst of everything is the guy that's equally matched with you. Those are those matches where you can't get each other. And then when the timer goes off, you're both just on the ground. Like, oh. <laughs> you know, those push you in a different way. Those, those push you up here a lot more, you know? So I uh, just, I like my students and I force my students. If I see a guy is only doing that, I'm, I will make him go with the other guy, you know? And, and uh, it's just, it's just the way I believe in, in progression, I guess. That's awesome. Yeah, there, there really is such an interesting ecosystem within any jujitsu room, like you said. Like, there's going to be the guys that can absolutely maul you, the people that you can maul, and then the people that are pretty much neck and neck. And sometimes they pass you, sometimes you pass them, and it's sort of this back and forth thing. And I love that you that you emphasize that, man. You can't ignore one group. You got to go with everybody because you know everyone brings something to the table for your development. So that was very well said, man. Um, you know, Dallas. Obviously, you're you're a very passionate teacher, man. I know you've been teaching a long time. How does teaching help you improve your jujitsu? 
do you, do you, how, how do you think that being a teacher for all these years has helped you as a competitor and just as a general practitioner? I, it 1000% being a teacher has made my jujitsu what it is today. Um, so, you know, I've been teaching at Lovato's for the last 13 years. I was like one of the other, obviously Rafael is the head instructor there, but I was like one of the other, uh, you know, full-time instructors there. And I started teaching as a blue belt. Okay. So I started teaching kids as a blue belt and then quickly started teaching fundamental jujitsu, which at Lovato's and at my academy, we have a curriculum system. It's like, uh, you know, everyone's different. Some places they just ba they they stripe you because you've had X amount of classes. They stripe you because they just deem that you're hit that next level and you're ready. So what we had to do was we had a list said, hey, to get your first stripe, you got to know this, 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 and this. To get your second stripe, you got to know this, 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 and this, which was great. Like the first stripe was mount focus. We learned mount defense and mount offense. Second stripe was side control, both sides of that coin, close guard, the back. So it's helping build this like this foundation. It's like you're going to spend a lot of your time mounted or in the mount, side control or you know one of those sides, someone on your back or in your closed guard. And so by the time you got to your blue belt, you had a pretty like good understanding of at least what was going on in the main world that you're living in in jujitsu, right? Um, and so that. That curriculum system, I went up through that, and that's how I learned. And then I was able to start teaching people off the curriculum, right? And so I became an instructor. I think a lot of it was just because of, you know, I was all in. Once I started teaching, I never took a second job. Uh, even though I needed money, <laughs> I never did because I was, I was a competitor and I was focused. And I, I didn't want anything other than I wanted jiu-jitsu to be my job. And so that's what I did. And... Man, so many times, like I like teaching is also a form of drilling, you know. And so, for instance, a, a very common pass is the knee cross pass, knee slice. I had a terrible knee slice until I was a purple belt. But a lot of that was like me teaching and showing and showing the mechanics, and like it helped me figure out where I was going wrong and what I was doing that, and, and it helped me drill and drill and drill and drill properly. And now. You know, one of those th passes that I just avoided because I wasn't good became one of my best passes. But it was through teaching that I really, you, you really have to figure out the minutia of everything. Like for me to explain it to you well and to really be able to help make you have those light bulb moments of your own uh, where you can really absorb what I'm throwing at you, I have to know my stuff. I really have to. And I have to be able to break it down. And some people learn in different ways. Some people, they're more theoretical. Some people, it's more physical. They need to feel it. Some people, it's the way you explain it. You know, and so everyone has different ways of, of modes of learning. And me having to figure out how to tap into as much of that as I can um, also just made me figure out the moves better. And so I went from, oh, man, I know this curriculum to, like, I know this curriculum. And now I know what, and like, it, it, it just really, man, like I said, it's, a lot of this, I, and I'm very passionate about the fundamentals, but I've been teaching it for a long time. And who's to say? I actually question sometimes. I'm like, had I not been an instructor and I just competed and just did that and I wasn't showing fundamentals all the time and I, I wasn't living in that world, maybe I wouldn't be as good at that stuff as I am now. You know? And so, and there's times I was very burnt out because I was going ham and I still had to show up and coach. And I was like, man, would I have been a statistic and like have quit jujitsu if I didn't have to show up for it for work? And it forced me to work through some things and I try not to think about it too much. It's a little bit of a mind trip, <laughs> like, you know, but, um, but 1000% man, by teaching, um, and, and really caring about my students, getting it down and not trying to just go through the motions and keep things exciting and fun. Like I crack a lot of jokes when I teach, I do better in a relaxed environment. Like if you want to be serious and be a competitor, there's, we will do it. Like there's time for that. But a lot of people are just hobbyists. They're just trying to get better, learn, have fun. And I do better at absorbing information myself when I when someone's not militant and crazy on me. Like, you know, like we'll go ham at comp training, but that's a different environment. So um, just by keeping things light, keeping things fun, keeping things learning focused, uh, you know, it, it helped me to grow my jujitsu, you know, and, and having questions. Hey, why do you do that? Why does it? I don't know. I haven't really thought about that before. 
and having to understand that stuff, you know, and, and, and figure that out over the years. Oh man, I 1000% credit like my jujitsu uh, for what it is from being a teacher and having started so early. A lot of guys don't even start teaching until they're black belts. Um, and to me, that's one of my super powers, so to speak, is that I've been teaching so long. Like, I think a lot of guys, they don't remember. Uh, by the time they're teaching, they don't remember a time when they sucked at the thing that they're teaching. And, and I remember I started teaching and I was not so far removed from that struggle that I could recall like it was yesterday. Like, oh, yeah, this is actually the little thing that really changed this for me. That really helped me out a big, uh, a big bunch. And what's so crazy to me is now I'm almost 20 years in my training and I can still recall like it was yesterday, those breakthroughs I had on some of that early stuff that I'm teaching my students. And that's what I mean by like my superpower. Like, I think it, it helps me tap in to all that in a way that most coaches can't because they, like I said, they're so far removed from when they weren't good and, and they weren't teaching that stuff back then. And so it really helped me out a lot and, and has really helped me not just be, I had some good success in competition and some big wins. And, uh, you know, I know that my jujitsu is solid, but, uh, for as much as what I was doing as a competitor, I'm a, I'm a much better coach, uh, than I was competitor. My ability to break through to people, I think is, is a lot, it's, it's a lot higher, uh, you know, and, I believe that my jujitsu is is world class, but I'm also just not a good competitor. Uh, you catch me on any given day, and I'm nervous as hell, and I'm having anxiety attacks, and, and like, you know, for me, a lot of like my, I've beat guys who are world, they're they're black belt world champions, and I've lost to guys that I should have absolutely smoked because of how nervous I might have gotten or something like that, you know. And so, my competition career was always a bit of this, but my ability to, to do my thing on the mats has always, you know, it's, it's always been good. It's been my passion and, and it's where I really excel in my opinion. That's excellent, man. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, I think we, you know, obviously jujitsu, we need more teachers. We need teachers more than we need world champions, in my opinion, for, for the for the general community and the art to continue growing into generations. Yes, the champions and and, and and the stars of the sport are what inspire and keep us keep the competitive ones uh, pursuing the art and pursuing the sport. But without the good teachers, man, it, you know, you can't even get out there and play without good teachers and good coaches. So I, I really commend you on recognizing what your superpower is and and really really doubling down on it. That's really outstanding, yeah. man. And I know that you've also got a, a brand new school now. Uh, you, I think you're, what, two weeks into teaching at this point. How's, how's the progression of the school so far? Yeah, so I just started my academy. I've been, you know, like I said, I've been teaching at Lavaz for the last 13 years. And I always knew this is probably what I'd end up doing is having my own school. I mean, I struggled with the thought of it too, actually. I was like, man, do I want to turn my passion into business? Because I'd seen Raphael. He's amazing competitor, but I've also seen him get completely stressed out by some BS at the academy and drama he's dealing with or whatever it is, like business stuff, you know, and I'm like, oh man, do I want to mix my business and pleasure? Uh, but really, this is what I do best and this is my calling. And so I knew it was a time to leave it. But even then, I, like I've been a black belt for some time. A lot of guys, they're, they're opening their schools before their black belts or they open... The minute they get that black belt, that's what they're waiting for to open their school. They're like, you know, it's like, I'm a black belt. And so um, even when I got my black belt, I still knew there was work to be done for me that I wanted to do things I wanted to accomplish before opening up my academy and just being able to focus on my academy. And so the time came, though, you know, I, I you know, a lot of people don't know. I, I, I've I've been I'm 38 years old now. I've been doing this since I was 22 um, I knew this is what I was going to do, but I see things, I think, through a different lens than what's typical. Um, just the, the value I wanted to give to my students. Like I said, I knew, even though I was a black belt, I wasn't happy. I knew there's some stuff I could do better and be better at before I opened my school. And, and I knew, too, I was like, I'm leaving a world champion training partner that's been my number one. Like, me and Rafael are basically each other's main training partners for the most part. Uh, over the last 15 years, you know, and I'm leaving that behind. He's not so far away. I still get to go up there every now and then, but I wasn't ready to just give that up either, you know? And so, um, but the time came and 
I knew I knew it had to happen. I, and like I said, I'm 38. I was like, I'm not going to do this when I'm 50. <laughs> so it's got to happen now or never. And so I decided to open up Method Jiu Jitsu here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and yeah, it, it, things are going good. I mean, I'm only in my second week, but I've got a good little core group of students already. Great people. Uh, you know, I, I just love the group I've got. And always, man, your OGs usually stay with you longer than anybody. Like, you know, anywhere you go, there's always like that, the, that little core OG group that's kind of like, uh, you know, sticks around. And so I'm trying to give these guys as much love and attention as I can, knowing that, you know, they're putting a lot of faith in me too. Like a lot, like I said, you don't know what you don't know. These guys are white belts. They don't know who Rafael Lovato Jr. is when they walk through my doors for the most part. And, and so, you know, I, it's important for me to give them the best that they can get and really open up their eyes. And, and they're riding with me when they don't know that what I've accomplished. They don't know I have BJJ Fanatics instructionals or what that means to them yet. They, they don't care yet. They will, you know, in the future, they'll understand. But um, so they're riding with me. And so I'm, I'm giving them the best, you know. And so, uh, but yeah, we're, it's small. I'm, I mean, it's our second week. We've got, I've got about 20 students signed up right now. Um, and I haven't even started my kids program yet. I wanted to get them up and running before I spread myself too thin. You know, I want all of my classes to be amazing. I'm super excited about my kids program. I haven't taught kids in ages. It was all adult focused at Lovato's for me after like my first year of teaching. And I'm excited to like have my little, my little young squad of killers, you know, like especially those, the, the prospect of having those, those guys that are with me from the time they're kids to adults you know, and being able to really put my stamp on them. Yeah, but I wanted to get my adult program kind of up and running. I, I don't, this isn't my city that I grew up in. So I don't have like instructors that I just trust and know right away. And so I know I want to make sure that I know who I can trust in certain positions to help me and who will be a good fit. Um, but I'm starting to enroll my kids program now. I'm starting to run ads and I'm going to start them up here in about a month and a half, two months. Um, but yeah, just a new baby school. Just, uh, but I, th I know what we have here is special. There's some good schools around here as well. Um, but I know what we bring to the table is a little different and that this place is going to be just a really special, amazing place. You've, I think I've shown you some videos or you might have seen. I, yeah. I've got some, some pro professional like content being shot. So people will get to see a real layout of the school, but it's beautiful. I, I, you know, it's my dream academy. I worked really hard just to be able to afford what I've done to this place, I had to do most of the work myself. Like the, the, to have it built out was not in my budget. <laughs> and so um, I poured my heart and soul into this place and I made it as beautiful as possible. It's a very cool facility, um, very unique. And yeah, man, I, I'm excited. But like I was saying, like I, I, man, I was living with my dad in my 30s to be able to travel and do the competitions and do things because I, I love teaching at Lovato's, but it's, you know, I'm just a, a coach at someone else's academy. And so the ceiling is limited, especially with what you can make money wise. But my thing was never money. It was, it was the skills, the, the ability chasing that, knowing that once I opened up my own school down the road, that it would be a special place. It would be, it would be worth it, you know, like worth all the struggle, worth all the, the being 30 in your mid thirties, living at home with dad or my girlfriend helping me out just because they saw what I was trying to do, you know, and now it's just like, now's the time to make it all pan out, make it, make the trip worthwhile. You know, we finally reached that destination. I have the things that, that I, I know I was chasing and I'm ready to give them to my students. That's outstanding. Well, man, like, like, like I was saying uh, off air to you before, I, I, I was looking at the pictures and the videos of your new place. It's a beautiful facility, man. And I'm really stoked to see it grow over time and, and what you do with it. So congratulations, man. It's really yeah, awesome. thank you. Yeah. Dallas, I'll tell you what, man, we've reached a point of the show. This is where I always play a game with my guests. This is a game called The Pummel. Uh, the Pummel's a series of random questions. Some of these are about jujitsu. Some of them have nothing to do with jujitsu. But if you're down to play The Pummel, I'd love to play this game with you. Uh, I'll respectfully decline. Oh, you're the first. No, you're, the I'm fir joking. you're the first one to ever lose the pummel game. I was actually just talking to a listener of the show. Uh, <laughs> he was saying, "Does anyone ever lose the pummel game?" And I said, "You know, not yet." But Dallas, man, if you turn it down, you're the first one to lose. No, so no, I'm joking. I don't want Hit you. Me. I don't want I'm you ready. to lose, bro. I don't want you to lose. All right, here we go. No. Here we go. Do your worst. I'm ready for you. <laughs> All right. Question one: What's uh, what you're talking? You know, we just talked about you're at, you're in the best point of your life career-wise. What was the worst job you ever had? 
the worst job I ever had, man, I had a couple. I had, when I was like 17, 18, I, I used to load uh, semi-trucks, semi-truck trailers with, I worked for a company that, that their semis delivered food to Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, and like KFC, I think, were the three. And so you just get a slip with an order, and you just go order by order, and you just load this thing, carry it to the truck, unload it, and, and and like the warehouse, man, you would have to go into the deep freeze and it was so cold. The fridge sucked being in. And then the regular warehouse was hot as like balls. It was horrible. And then I also had a job roofing. Like one summer, my friend's dad owned a roofing company and it was my first year out of high school. I was roofing in the summers. And bro, that was brutal. It, the heat, Oklahoma gets pretty hot in the summer and the heat was terrible. And then I was also young, I was 18 and I was hanging out with my friends at night and then I'd have to be up at four in the morning to, to like, cause we gotta be at the place as the sun's coming up cause it's too hot otherwise. And like not getting sleep and getting sleep deprived but then not wanting to not hang out with my friends, especially like, you know, I'm right out of high school, I'm just a kid. And so that sucked, like that sucked a lot. All that stuff was pretty bad. That's why I tell people it's easy to like get in the mode of too, of like, like there's shitty things about running a jujitsu school, you know, you're almost a janitor like cleaning the school half the time <laughs> true. and then you have to remind yourself you're like man it's definitely not roofing houses so it i need to quit being a baby <laughs> you yeah, know sure. Dude, i could not imagine roofing in tulsa man that must be oh my god and then uh yeah the warehouse i did i did a lot of warehouse work myself man but i never had one where we had all the seasons like you described so you had freezing areas you had scorching hot areas that's pretty brutal yes that's pretty brutal it was not cool what, what do you think is a secret talent that you have that people don't know about <sighs> Man, I feel like I'm very talented and most people are aware of all of them. I'm a special snowflake. <laughs> now, dude, I have no idea. I, I'm not very good at many other things outside of jujitsu. I was going to say, I was gonna say humility, man. After that answer, humility, yeah, bro. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm very humble and I'm the first to tell you. <laughs> nah, man, I'm, I'm not too good. I, I just hyper-focused at jujitsu and you know, I like, I still do play guitar. I still, still play music and, and love music. Uh, but you know, I just, jujitsu is my, my thing. I just like, other than that, I like hanging out with my dogs at home and my girlfriend and, and just taking it easy. That's awesome. I love it. What do you think is your favorite bad food to eat? Oh man, this one I will struggle on because if it has sugar in it, I love it. Like, you know, this ooh, this body has seen some damage um <laughs> man my favorite bad food to eat i'll tell you what actually this is the we there in in tulsa there's a place called uh dr custom okay. and it is a brazilian place and in, in the states you know in the states good brazilian food is pretty hard to find in a lot of cities uh, i'm sure there's those outlier cities where there's some good brazilian stuff but it's mostly like churrascarias, like, yeah. you know, there's Brazilian steakhouses, but this guy, he has like the pastels, like, oh, yeah, okay. and he makes them like good. And I'll go up there and crush like two of those things. In fact, now you got me thinking about it. I want it so bad. So <laughs> man, just deep fried, like cheesy goodness. Oh my God. That, and then literally any sweet dude, I'm, a, I'm, I struggle with sweets so bad. Uh, I fought in four different weight classes, man. I've been, <laughs> nice. I've been middle heavy where I almost freaking died <laughs> trying to make it. <laughs> I've been a heavyweight where I was okay. Uh, super heavy where I'm usually still like shorter than everyone, but stockier and still a little chubby at super. But that's where I've won uh, actually most of my big tournaments nice. uh, was at super. And then I fought ultra heavy, which I absolutely refuse to do again. <laughs> I hate ultra heavy, but I always say that. And then I end up being letting them them treats get to me so oh, no I, I'm, I'm i like i like super heavy and heavy but uh yeah food i i i growing up too i didn't mention this but i do like cooking as well i nice. i thought about going to culinary school becoming a chef i have cooked in restaurants when i was younger and that's what turned me off to wanting to be a chef but i still love cooking i just don't like the environment people screaming and cussing yeah. at you and it's high it's high stress it's not for me but i i love cooking and so I'm a foodie and 
it has not been good for the weight cutting career. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Dude, I'm right, I'm right there with you. I, I follow a really, I, I make up for it by following a really strict macro diet like during the week, but on the weekends, mm -hmm. it's just it's just mayhem. It's just, it's, I go good. through everything. You mentioned pastels, man. Pastels are a dangerous one. Those are so good. For people that out there that don't know, it's it's a deep fry, it's like a dough, and they basically, it's like a dough, it's about the size of like, an, of like a paper envelope, and they fill it with, um, I mean, various things, cheese, meat, chicken, you know, pizza stuffing, that kind of stuff. And yeah, then they deep fry the whole thing. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's not good for your heart, but it's good for your soul. So good. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I can remember being in Sao Paulo, eating them for the first time, being like, this is crack. Like it sounds, I mean, it doesn't sound like anything special when you just say, oh, it's deep fried this. It's like, we have equivalents of that. It's different. You got to so try like, it. Yeah. Dude, just the, the grease from the cheese was like, tasted like magic. I remember, you know, dude. <laughs> And then when I found this guy in Tulsa, I was like, holy crap, man, this is meant to be. <laughs> That's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah, dude, next time you're down here, let me know, man. I'll show you, I'll show you some other oh, spots yeah. you might not have seen yet. Um, For sure. what, do you, what do you think is your, your, your most hated food? What's something you can't eat no matter what? Oh, man, I don't eat seafood. Neither does my girlfriend. That's one of the things that we connected on. I was nice. like, all right, good. We can eat together. Um, <laughs> I hate fish, man. I, ever since I was a kid, it, like, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'll eat fried calamari if it's been fried and it, but that's like about as fishy as I get. I don't like any fish. So that's an easy one. I don't do fish. No seafood. <laughs> it's mm -mm. just the flavor. I just, it just grosses me out, man. Something about it. My taste buds just don't agree. Does, sa does salmon bother you as much as other fish? Oh yeah. Big time. Really still. Wow. Okay. If I have to eat fish, I'll eat like tuna and I have to do like a, like tuna sushi. Like it has yeah. to be uncooked. Yeah. I get like, once you cook it too, it makes it even more fishy. So yeah. I'm just not a fish guy. No, nah. that's it. So, so no, so no sushi either. You don't, you don't mess with a lot of sushi then at all, huh? No, gotcha. not unless it's like vegetarian sushi. I might eat it even though I'm not a vegetarian. Um, I just hate the fish. I hear you. <laughs> you know? I hear you, man. That's it. That's an interesting one. Cause some people, I know a lot of people that don't like fish cause it, like the fishier fish, you know, like the, the taste fishy. Uh, right. Right. A lot of people say that, yeah, salmon doesn't bother them as much, but you just say any, anything fish for you is, is, is off the plate. That's, that's interesting, man. Mm -hmm. What do you think is, uh, what do you think was the scariest moment of your life? Ooh, man, that's a good one. Uh, scariest moment of my life. Uh, honestly, I, I, since I was 16 years old, this will sound a little weird, but since I was 16, I've struggled with like anxiety I had some depression early on in my youth. And I remember my very first panic attack, like thinking I was gonna die. My heart's just pounding. I thought I was having a heart attack. I'm just a 16 year old kid. I ended up going to the emergency room. Like, you know, and those of you, there's be those of you out there probably never had any sort of anxiety attacks. Panic attacks, you won't understand. And I get it, it sounds crazy. But those of you that know what I'm talking about, it's crazy, especially your first one. You know, eventually you learn, okay, even when you have them, you, you know what it is. There, I was just like, I'm dying today, and it was it was it was brutal. It, it led to a really dark year for me of trying to navigate through that anxiety, that depression, um, and so yeah, that was that was scary, but that's helped. You know, I've had students that have struggled, and it's good to be able to connect with those people. Um, you know, especially, I mean, I, I've had times where my anxiety was maybe a little higher that week or month or whatever. Like, I'll go years where I'm good, and then my anxiety will be you'll have a little spike. And I mean, I've been a, in the Mount with Raphael smothering me and me like having an anxiety attack, you know? Oh and so, oh. so th those were never fun, but it, you know, it helps push you a little bit, I, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I'd say that was my, you know, I'm sure people probably don't give you super real answers all the time, but I appreciate if I'm being honest with you, it's like that. And that was, that was pretty crazy. That's good. So. I appreciate that. I appreciate that one. And I also, I'm also one of those people that connect with it as well. I've, I've had panic attacks yeah. before. They're horrible. It's good to know that you're not alone. You know, it's so, I remember going that, like I said, that first year was dark and you feel like you're probably the only person in the world suffering from this and you're going crazy. Yeah. And so I like telling people that it's like, you, you know, you're not going crazy. It, you will feel like you're going crazy and it sucks. It blows hard, but it's it's a thing, and a lot more people deal with it than you would ever imagine. And 
you know, you're gonna get through it. Yeah, without question, man. I had my first panic attack about the same age, actually. I was about 15 or 16. And I remember after kind of getting over it, it suddenly became like moving forward. I was panicked more about having another panic attack than I was yeah. about the thing I was actually worrying about. You're just sort of like feeling like there's this thing around the corner that could hit you at any time. Cause it hits you out of nowhere. No. It hits you out of nowhere. It so. does. And that's, that's exactly that first year. I, I, I was in a loop. Of, yeah. pa of constant panic and it was because I was worried about it and I'd bring on another one and it was yeah. it was like never ending you got to kind of get out of that loop and it's it's tough in the beginning and so um yeah man that's ex that is 1000 percent like you know they prescribed me Xanax and like hard drugs to like yeah. get out and 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 I didn't want to take that stuff but uh you know it, it's that's how real it is man you'll do, out of nowhere just Oh, you're gonna die! <laughs> and you're like, oh god. Oh, that's the worst. And, and I, I'm still, I'm not a good flyer. I, I get nervous when I fly. Sometimes I have flights and it's all smooth. I do have a lot of anxiety around flying, but I travel and I compete and I teach seminars all over the world. And I just told myself, I was like, I'm not gonna let anything stop me from doing cool stuff. <laughs> and like, you know, I'm not gonna stay home when I could be going to Europe to teach a seminar or wherever. Uh, I just refuse to let it get the best of me. You know. That's awesome. I love that, man. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing such a such a personal and candid answer, man. That that, that really is yeah. awesome. Um, what do you think? Who do you think is your favorite MMA fighter of all time? You mentioned Pride. Pride's Pride's also my favorite period of MMA. I think those are just the golden years of MMA. Uh, mm -hmm. who, who's your favorite MMA fighter of all time? Man, I don't have one favorite. I have a group of favorites for sure. Like Shogun, man. I was obsessed with Shogun when I was younger. I love his like jumping kicks. The his flying stomps and stuff over the guards. Yeah. And actually, you know, what's really cool too is Professor Rafael's, uh, his Muay Thai coach is uh, Mauricio, uh, Mauricio Vale. And Mauricio, his brother, Andre Gita, both of them came up in Curitiba in the Shootbox Academy. And they, they, they came up with Shogun, with Vanderlei, with Anderson. And I've got to learn Muay Thai from him. And like, they, he showed me like shoot, but like they would train that. So like they train how to jump over your open guard and stomp your head. <laughs> and like Mauricio is so cool. The way like I seem to be nerding out on jujitsu, he, he's like that on Muay Thai. Even if you've never done it a day in your life, he'll sit there and he'll talk to you. He's so awesome. Uh, he's a, and he's a ninja. He's a real life. You cannot touch him and he will light you up. Um, and he's a black belt in jujitsu too. And so he's a very cool person, but the, the shoe box guys, man, uh, Vanderlei Silva, Anderson Silva, Shogun Hua, uh, I loved all those guys. And then Fedor, especially like I'm built more like Fedor. Yeah. And, and that was, he was, he was really the one that made me want to do it. He made me really consider doing it, made me do it because you, you see these hyper athletic looking guys. They're just like juice to the tits and just, ah, they're massive. And then here's Fedor coming out with his little like belly and like kind of frumpy looking. Yeah. And then he just absolutely lights everybody up and like, Watching him, it was inspirational for me because like I said I was built like Fedor, especially back then. You know, I was I was out of shape. I, I wasn't. I hadn't been doing any sports in a few years, and he was. I was like, man, this guy is awesome. And, and so, and then I also loved Andre Arlovsky back in the day. I'm talking about Andre was jacked, but what I loved about him is he had like hairy shoulders and a hairy back. <laughs> he looked like a male model, yeah. but he was like hairy and I'm, I'm the same. I have like the grossest, hairiest back you've ever seen and hairy shoulders. <laughs> and then I see that and I'm like, yeah, this guy's a real one. What a, what a, what a pimp. Like, I love that, this guy. He's got that werewolf swag. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. No, it, it, and all those guys are old school. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, those are all old school guys, you know? Um, as far as new school, I, I still, I love, I say new school. Anderson, just seeing anyone, anyone who's a master of their craft like that, like he's like operating in the matrix, you know, that his fight with Forrest where you see him dodge like all three punches and then um, boom, like love it. And so, and I, I, I don't, I don't do a great job of staying current with a lot of the MMA stuff unless, unless they're just like the top guys. It's, I don't really know who they are yeah. for the most part. I kind of. MMA is cool, but it's not my thing anymore. And I, it, I'll, I just more or less I, I watch fights because friends are hosting them, and I just want to go hang out with buddies. Yeah. You know, I, li I like Volk a lot though. Yeah. Volk's oh, cool. He's incredible. He's, he's a monster. Incredible. He's a he's an absolute monster. Izzy, he, same thing. Izzy's got that Anderson esque like Matrix yeah. style. You know, uh, um, you know, I, I like a lot of those guys. And it's funny as I'm listing off a lot of strikers. 
I'm not even listing off jujitsu guys. Uh, but I just, I do love striking and I love seeing those guys that, like I said, it's like, it's like you're seeing Neo in the matrix. Like it's insane, you know? I'm glad you brought up Fedor because that, that's one thing that frustrates me is that Fedor is not mentioned enough as far as the greatest of all time. Like, man, he, he had, what was it, like 50 something fights where he didn't lose and then he lost one fight to Fabricio, right? Fabricio Wardoom was the first guy that beat mm -hmm. him. And then ever since then, it was like he was just wasn't, he, he didn't have the same aura among the fans anymore. And I, I never understood that. It's like, dude, the guy just won 50 something fights in a row in like dramatic fashion against really good people. And uh, yeah, yeah I, I never quite understood why he fell off the radar so much when people are having the conversation of, of the goats of, of MMA. I, it makes yeah, sense a lot of that was his mystique. And I guess people, they're so into that mystique because, you know, it was always that, that was the thing. He's the untouchable guy. Even, you know, like the Kevin Randleman fight when Kevin like picks him up and suplexes him backwards, like the most insane suplex I've ever seen. And Fedor lands on his like neck and then comes back and just submits him. You know, there's just that thing like, ah, oh, he's gonna he's gonna win no matter what. And then ah, you know, fans, man, they're fickle as hell. <laughs> the second you lose, they're they're on and on to the next thing. So Yeah. It's funny you mentioned not how, me, Fedor. Not me. Yeah, exactly. Not me either, man. Still your guy. We're still, we're still <laughs> team Fedor over here, man. Yeah. There's a. Uh, you know, it's funny. There, there, there's. Uh, you were talking earlier about how you don't know a lot of the, the a lot of the guys fighting except for the, like the, like the very top headliners, and that's kind of where I'm at too, man. That, that's been one of my biggest gripes with modern, especially the UFC, is that um, it's almost just like a revolving door at this point. I feel like the contracts that guys get are much shorter, so you don't get a time yeah, to really. Get I can't to keep know. up. Yeah, it's hard, man. It's hard, but I do still try to keep up. There's actually a guy who just won the ultimate fighter show uh, and then he, he uh, his name was kurt kurt holliba i think his name is man incredible jujitsu this this dude this dude just just won his fight uh, in the last event that they that, that i was watching and he won the ultimate fighter show but man high level like awesome jujitsu for anyone out there what that watches the ufc or mma still you got to check this guy out he's awesome i don't know if you've seen him nice. dallas but man i haven't seen him yeah, but I, it's funny i haven't watched the ultimate fighter since like before I started training same and but this season my teammate uh Aaron McKenzie from OKC was on it and he lost the first match um but he is he's a monster dude and I, I love Aaron he's so good he, he's got also got more heart than anyone I've ever seen he will never quit and he's in his 30s still trying to do the thing and like that's goes back to his heart and, he, and he's very talented he's he, he's awesome he was man I you know, especially Lovato's, it was a jiu-jitsu academy. Yes, Rafael did MMA and all that stuff, but he, his school was never like MMA focused, right? And, and we've had a few fighters come in through the years and help them out with their grappling, um, but it wasn't an MMA gym. And then Aaron comes in here, uh, my buddy, I'm talking about Aaron McKenzie, and he's already an accomplished MMA guy, and he had never had any formal jiu-jitsu training though. And super, hum like had a lot of humility, like stayed, he put on a white belt, started training in the gi and worked his way up. Now he's a brown belt uh, there. And like I said, you just don't see guys with that humility, like to do that sort of thing very often, uh, especially when they already had uh, some early success or whatever. And he's a special guy. And so he didn't win this season, but he's out there and we love you, Aaron, and you're a freaking monster. That's awesome. So. Man. That's really cool. Yeah, I haven't watched much of the show myself either, man. I I, I think the last season I watched was, uh, man, it must have been like when Ra I think when Rampage was a coach. Um, so that that's a while. That was a while back. I haven't mm -hmm. followed the show much, but but yeah, this dude that just won, man. He he was. You gotta check him out. He's awesome. I, I'm always like really stoked to see good jujitsu guys still carrying the flag because you've got you know you got Charles Oliveira, obviously Damian. Damian's about to retire, so so his so so when you see the OGs like Damian and and those guys moving their way, working their way out of the sport, it's nice to see fresh new blood coming in that, that carries mm -hmm. the flag of jujitsu. I'm always really stoked to see that. So. Um, um, well, anyway, man, let me ask you this. What, what do you think is your biggest phobia? Ooh, it's flying. <laughs> I already talked flying, to you a little yeah, bit about it. Yeah. It's flying. It's my most, it's my biggest manageable phobia, I guess. I used to be scared of spiders, but not anymore. I actually, unless they're poisonous uh, or venomous or whatever, like I will, I'm a, dude, I'm an animal lover, like big time. And so... I will even catch spiders in my house and release them outside because I don't like ki killing anything if I don't have to. Um, 
you know, I, and actually a part of uh, just a side note, I'm still trying to figure out how to do it exactly, but I'm trying to make a, a percentage of my tuition uh, donated to one of my favorite rescues in Oklahoma City, uh, where I got my our dog, me and my girlfriend got our dog Pete from them. Wow. Uh, they're called Mutt Misfits, and they're they're so cool. But yes, I I just I'm an animal lover. So, anyways, I used to have like nightmares about spiders. I remember the movie Arachnophobia coming out, and I used to have nightmares of like being covered <laughs> in spiders. Um, and like, actually it was weird, random side note, but I did a science project where you had to catch a spider and observe it and take notes. And I caught a black widow. I like, I found oh, one damn. in my black backyard. And just through like that week of observing the spider and being up close to it, like kind of helped get over that. And like I said, now I, I used to, the only spiders I'd kill is something I knew was poisonous. And I only really would do that because I used to have a, a, a hairless cat, a sphinx cat. And I was always scared that she would get bit. And so I did it for her. I'd get rid of them for her. But uh, I catch stuff and throw it out. So yeah, I got over one. That's a good. That's a good, good way to no, go. That, that's good for I just, sure. I just don't. I just don't love flying, man. It's like a coffin with wings. Like I'm just in the air, just waiting for something to happen. <laughs> so well, man, if it helps you statistically, you are way more dangerous driving. Like even, oh, yeah. even with even like on the interstate than you are on an airplane. If if that helps, try to keep. Well, that the bad in mind. news is it doesn't help. I, I'm familiar <laughs> with all the statistics, <laughs> and I'm like, man, this is supposed to help me, and it doesn't. That's how phobias work, man. People can tell you yeah. all the facts. Like my phobia is sharks. Oh, yeah. I'm terrified of sharks. And everyone will always say like, oh, you know, you have a better chance of getting struck by lightning than killed by a shark. My response is yes, yeah. killed by a shark. That's the key word. They don't count yeah. like people losing arms and legs and yeah, everything else. So it, I, I know like the data. So I probably shouldn't tell you about that shark that's right behind you right now. Oh, dude. Why'd you have to do that? <laughs> see, see if, you, if I was in a pool right now, I'd be, I'd be I'd, the, the water change color. I assure you. Um, it's funny you mentioned spiders too, man. Like, uh, yeah, spiders is a really common one. Like all the jujitsu guys I talk to, spiders is one that comes up a lot. It's so funny because it's like it's a small thing that you can just step on, but something about spiders, man, they really freak people out. Yeah. So, uh, what do you think is your favorite? Who do you think is your favorite superhero? My favorite superhero, man. Um, I really like. I never got super into this sort of stuff, like comics and stuff like that, but I did love the X-Men growing up. Nice. And I really loved Wolverine, which I think everyone likes Wolverine. Yeah. And I like Nightcrawler yeah. and Gambit. Nice. So Gambit, those three were like, I love those three. Like, uh, yeah, I like Superman. I mean, I like the, the Henry Cavill version of Superman too is pretty good. The Witcher is awesome. And so, I think liking him through his stuff made me like Superman, the idea of Superman more. I guess I'm just a fan of him. Um, but yeah, no, that stuff is cool. It was that I that was my thing. Like I liked Mortal. Com I'm not a big gamer either, but I loved Mortal Kombat. Yeah. yeah. And like especially the ninja characters, Sub Zero and all that. And I think that goes back to like I want to try to be a real life ninja and do jujitsu instead of just play video games all day. That's so I was always like. Cause I'm also also I'm like addicted. If I start playing video games, I'll be playing all day. And I'm like, I can't yeah, get, my, yeah. I can't let myself have the opportunity. You got to stay away from them. I know how that is, yeah. man. Yeah, Mortal Kombat was huge for me. And it's funny earlier you mentioned in the very beginning of the conversation Ninja Turtles. Ninja Turtles is like the reason I do martial arts. It's, that was my very yes. first foray. Same. So yeah, all that. In fact, you and I are exactly the same age. I'm also 38. So so you and I came up on oh, yeah. all the same stuff, man. I think that mm -hmm. I think between Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, Ninja Turtles, pro wrestling. I think pro wrestling had a big impact on me going towards grappling and jujitsu and stuff. It's it's always cool hearing people have similar similar. Uh, paths like that you know um, oh man i can't tell you how many times i hit myself in the face with some nunchucks trying to be michelangelo <laughs> as a kid that's more so than good. i want to tell <laughs> that's so good what do you if you could have a superpower what superpower would you choose oh god that's kind of i don't know i feel like i would be like uh like magneto he seems very powerful i want whatever he's got going on Give me his telekinesis metal bending abilities. Either that or being able to fly, which is hilarious, being that I am scared of flying. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like I'm like being but then that's me flying, all right? That's not the pilot yeah. that's gonna kill you're, me. You're in control. And you know, the best pilot I can already tell is me. I'm gonna be a great pilot. <laughs> Back to see it's the humility again, man. See it's there. A, there it is. <laughs> 
That's so awesome. I like that you mentioned Magneto, man, because Magneto was a, he he has a power that I never really appreciated um, until the newer movies, like the newer movies where he's like making like sending a coin through someone's head and like you know bending the gate at Auschwitz when he was when he was a kid and like yes. uh, disarms a guy's knife and then flips it around and like shoots it at him like a projectile and stabs the dude or um, when he was a kid even Pull, like, pulls like, iron out of the guy's blood. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He pulled the pulled the yeah, the tooth out of the guy's mouth or the filling. Yeah. Oh man, there's yeah, like so dude. many. He goes just, hard. Oh, bro, it's the same. Bro. I didn't. I didn't think about it as a kid, but those movies. That's what I was like, dude. This guy is, is like unstoppable. Yeah, I was dude. like, there's metal everywhere in the earth. I was like, this guy, yeah, and he can fly because of it. Yeah. See, I don't need to learn how to fly. You don't. When just, I have my magneto powers, just hop on a piece so, of sheet metal and you're good to go, man. That's it. Uh, you mentioned video games earlier. What's your favorite video game of all time? Oh, it's Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat. <laughs> Easy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would, yeah, Mortal yeah. Kombat and Mario Kart. Mario <laughs> Kart. Very yeah. polar opposite. <laughs> yeah, dude. Mario Kart was the jam for sure. Have you played the new ones? Yes. I, pe- I was playing my kid's son the other day. I was visiting. I taught a seminar in Kansas, and I stayed with one of my buddies, and his uh, son wanted to play. And I was like, man, this is a lot better than the one I came up on. So That's amazing. That's so cool. No, they're good. They're really good. Yeah, I, I've really enjoyed all the like the remakes. Like the more the new Mortal Kombat too is, is is pretty awesome. Like the newer the newer ones they've made in recent years are really cool too. What's your highest percentage submission at the moment? At the moment? Really my two highest percentage submissions are my X choke and my arm bar from the mount, which like I was saying, those are two things I used to never do, and now they're some of my best stuff. Um, and I mean, but that's like, the, my highest percentage submission is my crucifix, uh, without a doubt, and it's been that way since forever. Um, but whenever I, same thing, like I intentionally forced myself not to do crucifixes for a year or two, wow. uh, to force myself into new growth because it's my thing, you know? Um, and a funny story, like actually the, before I started training, do you remember a show called Fight Science by chance? Oh yeah, dude, I told you, they had like the animated, uh, um, like the animated 3D figures that would, that would demonstrate techniques. And yeah, yeah. Like that. yeah, yeah, totally. I don't know if you remember the one, but they had a jujitsu one and it had Hicks and Gracie on it. Yes, there. I do remember. And he did a crucifix. And this was like a week before I started training. And I saw, I saw this move and I was like, that's crazy. And like, I figured it out for myself, like, I, like very like rudimentary, but I, like I saw, I was like, oh, he's got their arm with his legs. And I, I kind of broke it down and li- I, like, it was the one move that I had in my brain burned in my brain before I got on the mats. And so I think that's the big piece of why it happened. So I was, I was catching guys in crucifixes my first week or two of training and like, I, I couldn't finish it and they were white belts and stuff, you know, it wasn't high level or anything, but, but like that, it was, it was the move I was looking for on day one. And so that I think is that I know is why like my crucifix is what it is today is because of that early exposure and like just having it burned in my brain from then on out. Like I always, same thing. It's not one of those mind trips. I'm like, had I not seen that episode or saw it when I saw it, my game might look very different, you know, but I did, and it had a big influence. That is so cool. That, that is, so you knew what the crucifix. So you had, you already had a technique to take in with you to day one. I think that's 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 probably not true for a lot of people unless they watched a bunch of UFC or something like that. You know, that, that's that's right. that's pretty incredible. Back in the time that you started jujitsu, I'm saying nowadays people have probably seen things, but yeah, fight science, mm-hmm. man, that was such a good show. There was fight science. There was fight quest. There was a couple of shows like that, that where they travel around yeah. to different worlds, d- different parts of the world, and I definitely remember mm-hmm. the Hicks and Gracie one. They were all standing like on the beach side on this kind of plaza. And uh, yeah, they were all rolling and stuff. That was a, that was a really cool episode. Um, man, Dallas, final question for the Pummel game. If a zombie apocalypse breaks out right now in Tulsa, what's the first thing you do? Uh, <laughs> grab my dogs, <laughs> grab my girlfriend, and get the hell out of here. <laughs> I'm not trying to fight with these zombies. <laughs> There's already enough. What's your plan? Where do you go? <laughs> See, now this is where things get real tricky. I don't have any sort of cool house in the woods or anything yeah. like that. So, man, I'm just driving out to the deserts of New Mexico or something trying go. to get out of here. There you go. Uh, I know a lot of people are just waiting to crush some zombies, but I don't know. I need some better guns before I do that. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, I don't feel, I don't feel like I'm well equipped. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. I always, I always wonder how many of those people that are like prepping for zombie apocalypses are actually going to be like the ones stick if they're going to actually stick around and take them on or if they're going to bug out to the desert or something. You know, it's, it's always interesting. I feel like there's just so many like unknowns like I bet the people that think they're ready like there's probably going to be something that they didn't think about that's yes. going to be the end it's going to be the end of them. Yeah. So I'm just like, hey man, I'm try if if that happens, maybe just take me out with everybody else. I don't know that I'm trying to live in this zombie life, you know. So I hear you on that. Well, man, good answer. And, and Dallas, that was the final question for the Pummel game. Congratulations, you win. Nice. You got your double underhooks. Dallas, there's something we were talking about earlier. You mentioned that you 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 knew what the crucifix was before you even started training, about a week before you started training, and um, and that's an interesting that's an interesting thing because it, it later on became a technique that you were really known for. Uh, why do you feel that the crucifix is such a valuable position? Oh man, it's just it's a great position to hold to attack. You have so many attacks from there. It's so versatile. You know, you have a million ways to choke the guy. You have arm locks, wrist locks. You have ways to get to the inverted triangles. You have the arm bars with your legs. Like uh, the reason, in my opinion, that you just, it's, it's more of a niche position. It seems like it's actually getting a little love lately, like seems to be kind of getting talked about more again. Um, but in this world of jujitsu, you know, when you talk about positional dominance, you're typically referring to positions that score you points. And you don't score points when you get the crucifix, even though you have just as much control, if not more control than when you had their back with your hooks in. And so I really think if you saw the crucifix as a, a position that earned points, we would see it like way more spread across the board. So I think it gets neglected mostly for that reason. Now for me, I don't care. I actually prefer it because that means more people don't do it, which means it's more unorthodox and it catches more people by surprise. And I also don't need points because it's such a good finishing position that you're going to be able to finish them. Like you don't need the points really, uh, as long as your crucifix game is, is good. So, uh, you know, it's the pro and the con of the crucifix. That's excellent, man. What, what do you think are some of the most common mistakes you see people make when, when they're trying to first develop the crucifix? It's just the, the mostly it's just their control is poor. You know, you see, people they don't have the right ability to stay attached to their partner the grips they're making you know that's the problem it's like any other move you, you you go for it and then you don't do it right and the guy's escaping a few times and you're like all right forget this i'm just going back to try and take his back right and it's mostly just the way to, to me it's the way i see it being held and the control positions uh that really make it where people don't enjoy it because they're not doing it right <laughs> and it's like oh you spend one day like doing a seminar or one deep dive on this and all that will go away. And then you'll be like, oh, this is actually the best thing ever. There's so many, you can get to the crucifix from freaking everywhere. And that's why it's like, so it is extremely valuable. I get it from my guard. I get it from side control. I get it from, I get it from the mount, people trying to escape the mounts. I get it, of course, from the back where it's turtled up. I mean, front headlock position. I mean, it's, it is everywhere. It's, really a shame more people don't do it because it's like it's one of those big bang for your buck moves like once you learn it you have a position you hit everywhere there's there's a lot of positions in jiu-jitsu where it's like i have this one very specific move for this very specific situation but then you have those moves that like really translate well across a variety of positions and situations and those are like man the more of those big bang buck moves you can stack and put it into your game the more, just the more you have, the better off you're going to be for it. And so to me, the crucifix is one of the absolute highest, most vers versatile moves. It's just, it's just relatively, uh, you know, it's not, it's not used nearly as much outside of guys like me and Barrett Yoshida and just a handful of guys, you know, Marcelo did it. Kron had a good crucifix. Uh, there's, I think this guy, Tanim or something. Uh, no, I'm probably mispronouncing his name, but I've heard really good things about his crucifix game. You know, and so there's a handful of guys out there that are just murderers with it. But across the board, I think people avoid it for the lack of points.
That makes sense. Yeah, but it's interesting. So I, I, I have a place that I like to set up crucifix a lot. It's usually when I'm attacking turtle. I'll get my leg weaved into their outside arm, and I'll get my forearm uh, underhooked on their on their other arm, and then I just do a front roll and end up in cruise. I'm sure you know you you you're I know exactly what you're familiar yeah. with that. Yeah, it's one of the most satisfying ways. It's one of the most, one of my most satisfying when it, when I hit it and like oh that's so awesome. It's just such a satisfying place to land. What what are some of your favorite like what what do you think is your highest percentage setup? What's your most satisfying and reliable side yeah so that position you're talking about is one of the easiest highest percentage places to find crucifixes um, and also that's where most people are worried about you taking their back yeah. and so most of their their focus is like how do i not let him take this, my back they're not focused on how do i stop him from crucifixing my arm which is part of what makes that easy to get to it, it, it takes them by surprise but that being said so like I kind of mentioned how I took the crucifix out of my game for a couple of years uh, to force some growth in new areas, but then I came back to it. And I came back to it though with a mindset of, I'm gonna do this in different ways than I did before. And I'm gonna kind of crucifix 2.0. And so now uh, the way I get to it the most and that I love is from front headlocks and front like double over like body locks, where typically the double over is a no-no. That's when someone hits like a peek out on you, you know, but whenever you know how to move your body and where to go, you're actually extremely dangerous from there, uh, especially in this crucifix world. And so, yeah, man, like uh, that's my, I, I literally will, and anyone who, uh, who follows my school page or my personal page, I actually had some rolling footage taken the other day, which I'm about to start uploading a lot more of. Uh, and you'll see me just like do a, flying crucifix like i will just jump on people from a distance to get into that double overs position it's so easy so much control and it's it it really it really jacks with people that's amazing. That's so cool. We well, you know you you use uh, the crucifix so well, Dallas, in both gi and no gi scenarios. Uh, what are some important concepts to keep in mind when you're using the crucifix in a no gi setting, uh, where there's not as much material to grab and control? Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of my favorite things about the crucifix, though, too, is it seamlessly goes from gi to no gi. Yeah. Um, you don't have to have, like, you know, some some stuff is just totally unavailable in no gi versus a gi and vice versa. This works for both. The only caveat is that you don't have the lapels anymore. And so the collar chokes are gone. But the, the rear naked choke is very easy to get to without the collar choke because most people are used to needing to use both arms to lock in a rear naked. You have to remember in a crucifix, the guys are like this. So they have no way to hand fight you when you're around their neck. So you need far less pressure to finish them than what you would need when they could reach up and try to pull down on your arm. So I love it. It's just like no gi. I'm going to look more for those, um, those RNCs, those one armed RNCs, super easy to get to very powerful. And then I do the, my best attack. My most like highest percentage attack is the arm bar uh, where I arm bar them with my legs and same thing. Gi and no gi. It doesn't change a thing about that. Their arm is still there and I still just take it. Incredible. That's so cool. Well, man, guys, if you're out there listening and this is an area of your game that you're interested, that you're interested in developing, uh, Dallas has an awesome instructional just about this. It's called Total Crucifix Back Attacks. Uh, it's available right now at bjfanatics.com, and I highly recommend you guys check it out if you want to get better at using the crucifix, which, as Dallas said, is a very dynamic and effective position. Um, Dallas, man, in closing, what are some of your major goals for 2023? What are some things you hope to accomplish by the time the year is over? So, you know, obviously with my academy being open, um, I'm just really trying to give a lot of love into this place, pour into it and just grow the school and, and make it a special place, uh, you know, a real one of a kind uh, jujitsu academy. And then, uh, you know, I haven't trained the last five months. I actually tore a ligament in my wrist when I was training with Rafael last summer doing some back uh, drills. It was really crazy freak thing. Um, and. I'm starting to get back into training now, getting back in shape and, and getting going. And I, I'm looking to get back into competing again um, nice. next next year. I'll probably be at the Brasileiro. I'll try to connect with you yeah. when I'm in Brazil. Please do. Uh, definitely, I'll be, be jumping to everything, especially I'm going to have my students that want to compete. And I know how cool it was to be able to go to tournaments with Rafael and compete alongside him. And I want, want them to be able to, to get some of that with me as well. Um, and then... Growing my social media presence, you know, I, I admittedly 
am a terrible at social media. I hate posting stuff and having to do that. Um, but you know, I want to be able to share more of my, my stuff with everybody. And so uh, I'm making it just a piece of my daily routine to, to upload content, especially for you, you guys. There's been so many, like you've heard me talk about so many of those light bulb moments that I've had where it just this one little detail changed everything for me. And I want to just kind of be able to, to get that, uh, to be able to share that with more people outside of just my students at my academy. And so I need to stop being such a wiener with my social media <laughs> and, and just growing that and, and putting some love into that. And, and, you know, and of course, uh, teaching seminars is another huge passion. I love just part of the BJJ community, being able to get out and meet new people. You know, I have some of my good friends now are people I met teaching a seminar in a foreign country. And now we talk all the time and, you know, I get to go back and visit them. And, and I just love uh, being able to share my jujitsu and my love of traveling outside of the actual travel in the air. <laughs> you know, once I land, super stoked on that. Um, and just, yeah, man, just, just keep doing the thing. Keep spreading my jujitsu. You know, I, I've got method jujitsu. I'm even looking to maybe start my own affiliates, you know, have some guys under me and help them, you know, have cool academies and, and help them with their marketing and some of these, these areas a lot of gym owners need uh, help in. And, you know, kind of getting my little crew together, my guys that I can kind of spread my, spread my love on kind of, you know what I mean? So yeah, I've got a lot of, a lot of good goals, a lot of big goals that I, I want to knock out this next year and, and looking forward to it, man. Super stoked. Well, folks, unfortunately, we're fresh out of time. Dallas, man, I've really enjoyed this conversation, brother. I appreciate you, uh, all your insight that you gave today. I loved hearing about uh, the, the growth of your of your school. I think that's something really valuable for people to hear about because there's a lot of students out there listening to the show who might someday aspire to be a teacher. So I appreciate you uh, sharing your experiences in that. Uh, man, the deep dives, the, the advice on the crucifix is excellent. And it was really cool hearing about your background as, as being a musician and a guy that was into skating. and how so of, cor of course it had to happen. It had to happen. It had to happen, man. <laughs> so, man, I appreciate your time today. You're welcome back anytime in the future. Oh, man. Thank you. Of course. For anyone out there that wants to keep up with Dallas, it's real easy to do so. He's active on Facebook. You can type Dallas Niles or you can type Method Jiu Jitsu. Uh, his, his school is Method Jiu Jitsu Tulsa uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. His Instagram is Dallas Niles. His website is Method JJ Tulsa. Uh, if you guys are ever traveling through Oklahoma, make sure you guys stop in. He has a beautiful facility that he's worked really hard on. Uh, so, if you guys are ever passing through, make sure you uh, drop in. He also does seminars all over the world. So, you guys make sure you're following him on social media to keep up with where his next ones are going to be. And if you can't make it to a seminar and you can't make it to Tulsa, you can learn from Dallas anywhere in the world here at BJJ Fanatics. He has several instructionals with us. The one we dove into today was called Total Crucifix Back Attacks. Uh, but, but Dallas has also uh, got a very uh, deep, uh, deep half guard game as well. Uh, it's something he's also known for. So he's got a few instructionals on that and he's got some gi and no gi options and some other things that he's uh, filming in that are in the works with us right now, including Dallas Alice, correct me if I'm wrong, possibly a free instructional? Man, you are not wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, you guys hear me talk a lot today about kind of like those little, those little moments I've had, a lot of breakthroughs, and I know a lot of the stuff that I've taught my students that I've seen have really big improvements, um, and I just want to give that to you guys and, and it just expose more people to my teaching and see if you drive with it, then maybe you want to pick up some of my other stuff, but I kind of want to, you know, it's my gift to, to people. I, I just love like sharing my knowledge and, and yeah, hopefully, hopefully you enjoy my teachings. That's awesome. So you guys, yeah, that's going to be dry, uh, filming, filming soon. Uh, still, still, still working out the, uh, the, the filming schedule, but that is something that's going to be coming out. So make sure you're paying attention to the website. In the meantime, check out the crucifix instructionals, check, check out the deep half guard instructionals because they're outstanding. Whether you're gi or no gi, he's got options for both. And, uh, and that's going to do it for this episode, everybody. I really appreciate you tuning in. Please stay tuned for the next episode of the BJJ Fanatics podcast. <laughs>